Hey, Chapel Street Church family. I'm excited to tell you about our next generosity initiative. As you probably know, every year at Advent season during Christmas, we select a Serve the World partner to tell you their story, to pray for them, and to encourage you to be generous to what God is doing in their ministries. And then usually one other time a year, we pick another Serve the World partner to do the same thing. This year, with our Vacation Bible School students happening right now, uh, who are always generous during those weeks to give, we've decided to partner with our kids to support a ministry called Cure Zambia. Cure is a remarkable ministry. They're putting first world hospitals in developing countries. And the hospital in Zambia, Cure Zambia, is one I've actually been to with my wife years ago to see firsthand this life-changing ministry that they're a part of. And we have a church-wide goal across all of our campuses, together with our kids in VBS, to bless this ministry, to provide enough money to hire a new surgeon, equip a new surgical center, and provide the necessary resources for the children's equipment as they recover from these life-changing surgeries. Again, I've been there, I've seen these families and these children and how what Cure is doing changes them, transforms them, both physically and spiritually. And so together, this is a great opportunity for us to demonstrate the generosity of our God across the world. Let me just take a minute to speak to those of you who have never yet taken a step of generosity here at Chapel Street Church. This is the perfect opportunity for you to take that step, to be generous to what God is doing, because this money is being given away to bless a remarkable ministry and bless people we may never meet, but people who God sees and God knows and God loves and cares about. So let's together as a church family, along with our kids, be generous and reflect the heart of God. When we're generous, we reflect God's heart, we move the mission forward, and we remind ourselves that this life, all we have is a gift of God's grace. It's not ours, it's His. So Chapel Street Church, let's jump in this journey together. Well, what a great opportunity that we have to follow our kids' lead in showing generosity and making an impact, being a part of this partnership with Cure, this great organization doing such good work in Zambia. Pastor Jeff mentioned it um, in his video, but, but this is part of who we are as a church. This is something that is in our DNA. We believe this, that, that generosity is one of the ways that we worship God, that, that God is honored and blessed, and God uses our giving in great ways here in our community, at our church, but also all the way around the world. We believe that everything we have is from him, and everything belongs to him and should be used for his purposes. And we're gonna be talking about this project for the next several weeks, and today I just want to invite you to consider how you might be a part of this project how you might be able to, to give what you have. If you're a part of our church, especially if you've never been part of this before, what better way to start? What, what better project than this? Knowing that every dollar will be given away and every dollar counts and we want every one of you to be a part of this. And so start considering what it might be for you, whether it's not getting coffee or lunch one day or something much greater than that. We want you to be invited and we want you to be a part of this. You can check out our website for more information as well. Uh, let's pray as we open up God's word. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the celebration of baptism. We thank you for the gift of worship. We, we thank you for people that do good work all the way around the world and that you invite us to be a part of it. Father, as we open up your word now, we ask for wisdom. We ask that you would speak to us in this moment and in this place. We pray all this in your name, amen. Uh, several months ago, uh, my wife Judy and I had a conversation about uh, whether or not she would attend what was, in her words, one of the most important moments of her life, seeing Taylor Swift live at Soldier Field. <laughs> uh, some of you might be aware of this, her, her nationwide concert tour that's, that's going on. What you might not be aware of is the lengths that people have gone to to be a part of it. I was researching this the other day. According to one article that I read, the average resale ticket price to go to a concert over $2,400. Some tickets are going for over $30,000. Can you believe that? Uh, a, a chocolate company in Philadelphia ran a contest where they sold candy bars with a code inside, and if your code was picked, you would win a ticket to her show. Like, we're going full Wonka here, people. This is crazy. <laughs> For those that, that did go, some tried to earn their money back. Uh, one person took confetti that I guess uh, was used in the concert and picked a bunch up from the floor and tried to sell it on eBay for $55. Oh. 
At one of the shows, I guess it rained, and someone took a jar of rainwater and tried to sell it for $250. <laughs> this is my favorite one. Uh, I don't know if this one is serious or not, but, but someone tried to sell a bag of concert air. And this was the quote. Listen to this. It cannot be confirmed, but there is a high probability that Taylor actually breathed this particular sample of air at some point in time during the show. This is your chance to have a piece of her and the air is to her forever, $100. <laughs> That's the best sentence I've ever read. That's incredible. I truly believe this. If Taylor Swift wanted to take over the world, she could. Like, she does not have fans. She has an army. It's incredible. Uh, and to answer your question, my wife did not go. Uh, we decided to pay our bills that month. That was the, <laughs> that was the choice that seemed wise. Um, today, we are in week two of our summer series, The Pursuit of Wisdom, as we spend the next few months exploring the book of Proverbs and the wisdom that is found within it. Wisdom, as we looked at last week, is not the same as information, not the same as knowledge, but rather this is the definition of wisdom that we gave, that wisdom is the skill of living a godly and faithful life. Wisdom is a skill of living life the way that God wants us to. It's not just about being smart. It's not just about knowing the right answers. It's about having the ability growing in our skill set to apply what we know about God to live in the world that he has made. Charles Spurgeon put it this way, that wisdom is the right use of knowledge. This is why Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs, because like Taylor Swift's most devoted fans, he too believed that there was something worth any price something worth pursuing, a treasure that there would be no lengths that we do not go in order to find it, that we should be devoted in our pursuit of the wisdom of God. Today, we're continuing our study by turning to Proverbs chapter two, and what Solomon does here is give us three ways to do just that, three ways to find and be filled with the wisdom of God. We see the pursuit of wisdom, the source, and the path of wisdom. We'll start with this first one, the pursuit of wisdom. If you have a, a Bible with you, turn with me to Proverbs chapter two. Uh, we're gonna read the first five verses here. Pro Proverbs two, verse one. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, listening closely to wisdom and directing your heart to understanding, furthermore, if you call out to insight and lift your voice to understanding, if you seek it like silver, search for it like hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. Uh, recently, I was talking to a, a friend of mine about uh, the skill that people have that we are most jealous of. Have you ever thought about that? What is, what is the skill? What is it that some people are able to do that, that if you could instantly master one thing in the world, what would it be? My answer uh, is the skill of being able to fix things. Uh, I am the least handy person that you know. These are preacher's hands and not worker's hands. They can't do anything. Uh, and so some people are like this, and maybe you're like this, where if something is broken, your brain just kind of knows what to do about it. You just know how to fix it. These are the people that don't read instruction manuals. They just throw them out immediately. Uh, and I am the complete opposite of that. If something is broken, I just give up immediately. I take my car to the shop and they tell me what's wrong. And you do that thing, you're just not along and pretend you know the words that they're saying. That's where I'm at in life. If I could master a skill, it would be that one. So all that to say, if anything is ever broken in your house, don't call me unless you need me to pray over it. I can do that just fine. That's all I have to offer to the world. This is what Solomon is teaching here. Put the verses back up here and, and notice with me for just a second all of the action words that we see in this passage. Notice what we're supposed to do with wisdom, something to accept, something to store up, something to listen to, to direct our hearts toward. Go to the next verse. Furthermore, if you call out for it, if you lift your voice for it, if you seek it, like silver, search for it like treasure. It's this idea that Solomon is teaching that wisdom is worthy of any pursuit that we might give it. Wisdom is a treasure 
something to store up in our hearts that there is no skill more worth having than knowing how to live wisely in the world that God has made. This is something that that Solomon teaches throughout the Proverbs. In in Proverbs 3, verse 13, we see this, that, that happy is a man who finds wisdom and who acquires understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and her revenue is better than gold. In chapter four, verse seven, it says, wisdom is supreme. So get wisdom. And whatever else you get, get understanding. The wisdom of God is a treasure worthy of our pursuit. Why? What makes wisdom so valuable? What makes it worthy of our pursuit? Here's what I think Solomon is showing us. Two benefits of wisdom. That wisdom equips us and wisdom transforms us. Wisdom equips us. When we pursue wisdom, this is what we gain. Insight, understanding, instruction. That that wisdom leads not just to intelligence, not just to cleverness. Wisdom leads us to the very knowledge of who God is. Paul talks about this in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and in verse 30. He says, It is from him that you are in Christ Jesus who became wisdom from God for us. In other words, when we pursue Jesus, or when we pursue wisdom, rather, it is Jesus that we find. He doesn't just have wisdom, he is wisdom. Becoming wise is the process of God equipping his people <clears throat> to respond his way. God equipping his people to see the world as he does and know what to do about it. Isn't that something that you want? Don't you want that? Isn't there, isn't it hard to think of many things that the world needs more than that? Wouldn't you love to be able to look at the world and see all the issues that are going on and and isn't it so easy to feel overwhelmed? And like, you just don't know what to do about it. Don't you wish you could see those things clearly, see those things as God does and know how to respond? Don't you want that when you're talking with a friend and the subject of God comes up and you're tempted to just freeze or change the subject? Don't you wish you could see that person as God does? To know how to respond to their questions, their doubts? Parents, isn't this something you want for your kids? As we raise them in a world filled with opinions and messages and questions about what good is and who God is, don't you want them to see things clearly, to see what truth is, and yet also to know how to respond in love and grace and understanding? This is what wisdom offers. It equips us to see the world as God does and to respond as he would. Wisdom equips us. That's the first benefit. It also transforms us. And again, this is a theme of Proverbs teaching that becoming wise is not just about taking in good advice, not just about learning good behavior, but wisdom rather is the process of God transforming our hearts to become more like his. Look with me to Proverbs chapter three, the first couple of verses here. It says, my son, don't forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commands. For they will bring you many days of full life and well-being. Never let loyalty and faithfulness leave you. Tie them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. What does that mean? Let your heart keep my commands. How do we do that? Wouldn't it make more sense for our minds or our hands or our feet to keep commands? How can our hearts keep the word of God? Here's how I think about it. Uh, Think for a moment about the difference between a partnership and a marriage. Imagine that in your work, you, you made a partnership agreement with another person or another company. And in that agreement, there were a list of things that you agreed to, that you wouldn't cheat the other person that you would act with integrity, that you would be honest with each other. And if you broke that agreement, there would be penalties or fines or some sort of consequence to pay. 
Now, whether or not you liked that person, you would probably follow the agreement, wouldn't you? Contrast that to a marriage where you make the same agreement, except they're called vows. Same behavior, same agreement, completely different relationship. Why? Because in that partnership, you obey because you have to. In a marriage, you obey because you love that other person, because your heart has been transformed. It is not just your mind that does those things. Your heart keeps the commands. This is what wisdom offers to us. There's a great verse in uh, Jeremiah chapter 15 uh, that says this, your words were found and I ate them. Your words became a delight to me and the joy of my heart, for I bear your name, Lord God of armies. In other words, this is the second benefit of wisdom, that when we pursue it, God doesn't just promise to change our behavior, he promises to change our very hearts, to love the things that he loves and become more like him. Wise people don't just follow God because they know they should. They do it because they have been and are being transformed by the love of God. Because they've seen how good life is when they live how God intends. Wisdom equips us to respond as God's people and it transforms us that we would love to do so. I love how Jesus puts it this way in his Sermon on the Mount, that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is how we are to view wisdom. Priceless, invaluable treasure worthy of our pursuit. That we would cry out, that we would store it up, that we would ask for it, long for it, pray for it, search for it in his word. Do we? Do you? Do do I? As we look at our lives, do we view wisdom as a treasure worth pursuing? Do we cry out for the wisdom of God? Are there no lengths that we would not go to in order to find it? What if we did? What if this was our desire, the cry of our heart, that God, more than anything the world can offer me, what I want is your wisdom to see things through your eyes and to be able to respond as you would. Would your wisdom transform my heart and the way that I live and the choices that I make and the words that I use? This is the pursuit of wisdom. That brings us uh, to the next part of our proverb, the source of wisdom. Uh, I'm sure I've uh, shared this story before. I remember the exact moment in my life where I realized that I was not as smart as I thought I was. Uh, I was 18 years old. I was a freshman in college. I don't know how you were when you were 18, uh, but when I was 18, I was pretty convinced that I had figured everything out. Like I was, I was pretty smart. I knew it all. Uh, it only took 18 years. Pretty impressive. No big deal. Um, and when I went to college, my first ever exam in college was for my uh, Old Testament class. And my Old Testament professor was famous for how difficult his classes were. And I remember someone coming to me and asking if I was worried about that exam. And I said, I'm not worried about the exam. The exam should be worried about me. (laughs) That is the most annoying thing I've ever said. That's awful. (laughs) And sure enough, I sat down, I took that test and I got a D minus, which was the lowest in in, uh, in my entire class. And, And that was all that it took for me to realize that maybe there was someone out there smarter than me that maybe there was a source of wisdom that I did not have access to. Some of you are wondering, should we be listening to D minus preach? (laughs) I got an A minus in the class, relax, we're gonna be fine. (laughs) This is what Solomon's teaching to his son. Look with me to, to Proverbs two, verses five and six. It says, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Notice this with me, how Solomon has been giving us all these ways to find wisdom that if we listen for it and if we cry out for it and if we search for it, and it's all of these if statements. And finally, in verse five, we get to the then. If you do all of this, then what? You understand the fear 
of the Lord. You discover who God really is. Think back if you were uh, with us last week to the first proverb that Solomon gave to us. How he introduced this idea of wisdom. Proverbs 1 verse 7 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. Fear of the Lord is the foundation. The beginning of Knowledge. Again, it's important to understand what fear of the Lord really means. What we're not saying is that we must be fearful of God's anger that might erupt at us in any moment. What he's not saying is that God is against us and we should tiptoe around him in case we make him mad. Fear of the Lord is simply seeing who he really is and being in awe of what we see. Fear of the Lord is recognizing that there is an all-powerful God and there is a perfect source of wisdom and it is not me. I love how C.S. Lewis puts it. You thought you weren't gonna get a C.S. Lewis quote, didn't you? (laughs) In God, you come up against something which is in every respect immeasurably superior to yourself. Wisdom recognizes that it is not my place to decide right and wrong, good and evil, that the boundaries that God places in my life are gifts from a loving father and not shackles from a cruel and disappointed one. This is the beginning, the foundation of what it means to be wise, to recognize that true wisdom is not something that I can just muster up on my own. There is only one source, one beginning of wisdom. We see it in verse six. The Lord is the one who gives it. His mouth come knowledge and understanding and not my own. This is why Solomon begins this proverb the way that he does. We saw this back in verse one. He says, my son, if you accept my words. In fact, this is what the first seven chapters of Proverbs are, a a series of teachings from Solomon to one of his children. And over and over, this is how he begins it. We see back in uh, verse one, uh, or in chapter one in verse eight, it says, listen, my son, to your father's instruction. Don't reject your mother's teaching. In chapter four, my son, pay attention to my words. Two more times we see this in uh, chapter five. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. My son, obey my words. Do you see the pattern? Solomon here is longing for, calling out for his son to listen to his words, to believe that there is no wisdom and there is no knowledge outside of what God has said. This is the way that wise people live. This is what it means to fear the Lord, to declare that God is God and I am not. He is the source of wisdom. Life is better when he is in control. Recently, I came across an article uh, written by an MIT professor uh, named Rosalind Picard. Uh, Dr. Picard, on top of teaching, is a scientist, an inventor. She has founded multiple research organizations. I'll be honest with you guys, when I read her bio, there were a lot of words that I didn't know the meaning of. So we'll just call her a smart person. Is that cool? So this smart person uh, wrote an article about the way that she came to faith in Jesus. And I was struck by her story. Listen to how she describes the way that she initially thought about faith and some of the hesitations that she she had. She said, "Uh, I assumed that faith was not intellectual or based on evidence, that religious people were not real thinkers, and that if they only thought hard enough, then they would see that their religion was unnecessary. I believe things I heard, such as that religion was invented to help people cope better. I thought my way without any God was the truth and was scientific, therefore it was the best way. She goes on and she talks about how she came to faith, how someone in her life was a good neighbor and talked to her about God and gave her a Bible and told her to read Proverbs. And she was amazed at the wisdom that she saw in it. She ended up reading the rest of her Bible and started questioning and wondering about faith. And and she describes in her writing this kind of wrestling match that she had between her way and her being in charge and her being in control and trusting her life to Jesus. 
This is how she ends the article. I love this. She says, today, I am a professor at the top university in my field. I have incredible colleagues who have helped translate my lab research into difference-making products, including a smartwatch that helps caregivers save the lives of people with epilepsy. I told you, smart person. I once thought I was too smart to believe in God. She goes on, now I know I was an arrogant fool who snubbed the greatest mind in the cosmos, the author of all science, mathematics, art, and everything else there is to know. Today I walk humbly, having received the most undeserved grace. I walk with joy along the most amazing companion anyone could ask for, filled with desire to keep learning and exploring of all people to trust in their own knowledge and wisdom, it would be her. Brilliant minds, top professor, someone who truly believed my way is the best way, who now walks humbly and joyfully because she recognized that there is only one source of wisdom and it was not her. This is the question that wisdom requires an answer to. It's a question that Solomon asked of his son, and it's the question that your heavenly father today asks of you. Will you accept my words? Will you accept my words? Are you willing to accept the wisdom of God? Are you open this summer as we continue in this series to hear something that might challenge you, make you feel uncomfortable, to recognize a part of your life in which you have been foolish? Are you willing to change a habit, to turn back from sin, to humble yourself if the wisdom of God shows you a place of pride? Do you believe that there is someone out there who knows more than you do? even about your own life? What is the source of your wisdom? Yourself, your ever-changing culture, or the greatest mind in the cosmos, the author of every good thing in your life and in mine? This is the invitation that wisdom gives to recognize that he is the one who gives it. He is the source. His way is the best way and I can trust in him. He is the source of wisdom. Last thing I wanna show you today, uh, that he is the path of wisdom. Turn with me uh, to, back to Proverbs 2. We're gonna read the last several verses here today. Verse seven says this, he stores up success for the upright. He is a shield for those, <clears throat> those who live with integrity so that he may guard the paths of justice and protect the way of his faithful followers. Then you will understand righteousness, justice, and integrity, every good path. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will delight you. Discretion will watch over you and understanding will guard you. Back when I was a senior in high school, I remember going through uh, this season where I felt so much anxiety about where I was going to go to college that next year. I had been accepted into two schools that I was interested. Both uh, would allow me to study ministry, which I knew I was called to do at that point. And and I remember going through this time of of trying to discern, trying to figure out which door God wanted me to walk through, which school was right for me. And I, I was just praying about this for months and asking for wisdom and asking for his guidance. And, and I remember talking about this with one of my youth leaders at my church. And he said something that was so foundational for me. He said, what if both doors are open and there's no wrong answer as long as you still follow Jesus? I remember thinking about that and and it changing the way that I think about wisdom. And this, I think, is how Solomon describes what it means to live wisely, not as a door to choose from, but a path to walk on. He describes it this way all throughout Proverbs. In in chapter four, verse 11, it says, I am teaching you the way of wisdom. I am guiding you on straight paths. So often I think we get this wrong where we think of the wisdom of God as, as what school should I go to or what person should I marry or what job should I take or what place should I live in? 
God cares about all of those things, but this is what Solomon is writing, that God cares more about the person that you are becoming than the place that you are going. This is the image that Proverbs uses, that there are two paths that we can choose from, the path of righteousness and justice and integrity and rest and peace, the path of God's presence and the path of evil and wickedness and death. And over and over, this is Solomon's instruction to his son to choose your path wisely. Many of you will have heard these verses. This is Proverbs 3, verse 5. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, know him and he will make your paths straight. This is Solomon's point. And this is how wisdom enters into your life. Not by living in fear that if I make the wrong choice, somehow God is gonna be mad or I'm gonna be outside of his will. Wisdom isn't a door, it's a path. It's a way of living. It's a place where these things reside. Look at verse nine with me. It says that there is a place of righteousness and justice and integrity. That is the path that God has called us to. If you have a decision to make in your life, if you're wondering what you should do, this should be the filter through which you view it. That if I take that job, or I marry that person, or I move to that place, will I become closer or farther away from the way of Jesus? Will this job expect me to give up my integrity in order to make a profit? When I'm around that person, do I become more loving and caring and kind to others or do I become more judgmental, arrogant, cruel? This is the filter through which we view things. Will I stay on the right path if I say yes? As long as we do, then there's freedom for you to choose and there is trust that God will lead you as you do. Timothy Keller puts it this way. He says that who you become is a product of how you do the little things every day. This, I think, is what Solomon is teaching us, that wisdom rarely just shows up when you have a life-changing decision to make. If you want to be wise, it is built on the everyday steps of faith that you take towards the way that Jesus has called you to. This is the calling of wisdom, the the fatherly advice that Solomon offers to us all today to keep walking towards the wisdom of God, to keep pursuing him, to be devoted to his word and to prayer, to accept the words that he has given you and take one step of faith after another and trust that his word and his way and his understanding is enough. He will make your path straight. He will keep you in the way of life. This is the way of wisdom. Let me pray for you. Our Heavenly Father, we we do thank you for the wisdom that you offer, the wisdom that is found in your word, and the promise that you make, that we can trust in you. Lord, I do pray today for those that are making a decision, those that are seeking your will, longing to know what you would have them do. Lord, we pray that you would protect our path, that you would guide us, that you would reveal to us how it is that we can honor you best, no matter what choices we make. Father, I ask that you would put in us a spirit of longing for your word, longing to spend time in your presence, that you would give us humility to accept what you tell us to do. Make us wise. This is our prayer. Amen. Amen. Again, we're so glad that you could be here today. If we can be praying for you, anything going on in your life, if you're in need of the wisdom of God, our prayer team is available back in the glass room. If you came prepared to give, we're thankful for your generosity. There are boxes in the back you can give online as well. Would you receive now today's benediction? Would you go in the power, the knowledge, the righteousness, and the wisdom 
of Jesus Christ, the one who is the wisdom of God. Would you trust in his ways, follow his lead, and walk on his path? Amen.